This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne Chapter 3 In which a conversation takes place which seems likely to cost Phyllis Fogg dear. Phyllis Fogg having shut the door of his house at half-past eleven and having put his right foot before his left five hundred and seventy-five times and his left before his right five hundred and seventy-six times reached the reform club an imposing edifice in pall mall which could not have cost less than three million he repaired at once to the dining-room the nine windows of which opened upon a tasteful garden which the trees were already gilded with an autumn colouring and took his place at the habitual table the cover of which had already been laid for him his breakfast consisted of a side dish a broiled fish with reading sauce a scarlet slice of roast beef garnish with mushrooms, a rhubarb and gooseberry tart, and a morsel of Cheshire cheese, the whole being washed down with several cups of tea, for which the reform is famous. He rose at thirteen minutes to one and directed his steps towards the large hall a sumptuous apartment adorned with lavishly flamed paintings a flunkey handed him an uncut times which he proceeded to cut with a skill which betrayed familiarity with this delicate operation the pursual of this paper absorbed phyllis fogg until a quarter before four whilst the standard his next task occupied him till the dinner hour dinner passed as breakfast had done and mr fogg reappeared in the reading room and sat down to the pall mall at twenty minutes before six half an hour later several members of the reform came in and drew up to the fireplace where a coal fire was steadily burning they were mr fogg's usual partners at whist andrew stott an engineer john sullivan and samuel fellington bankers thomas flangelin a brewer and gothier ralph one of the directors of the bank of england all rich and highly respectable personages even in a club which comprised the princes of english trade and finance well ralph said thomas flangelin what about that robbery oh replied Stock. the bank will lose the money on the contrary broke in ralph i hope we may put our hands on the robber skilful detectives have been sent to all the principal parts of america and the continent and he'll be a clever fellow if he slips through their fingers but have you got the robber's description asked stuart in the first place he is no robber at all returned ralph positively what a fellow who makes off with fifty five thousand pounds no robber no perhaps he's a manufacturer then the daily telegraph says that he is a gentleman it was phyllis fogg who had now emerged from behind his newspaper who made this remark he bowed to his friends and entered into the conversation the affair which formed its subject, and which was town talk, had occurred three days before at the Bank of England. A package of banknotes, to the value of fifty-five thousand pounds, had been taken from the principal cashier's table, that functionary being at the moment engaged in registering the receipt of three shillings and sixpence. Of course, he could not have his eyes everywhere. Let it be observed that the Bank of England reposes a touching confidence in the honesty of the public. There are neither guards nor gratings 
to protect its treasures. Gold, silver, banknotes are freely exposed at the mercy of the first comer. A keen observer of England, Customs relates that being in one of the rooms of the bank one day, he had the curiosity to examine a gold ingot weighing some seven or eight pounds. He took it up, scrutinized it, passed it to his neighbor, he to the next man, and so on until the ingot, going from hand to hand, was transferred to the end of a dark entry, nor did it return to its place for half an hour. Meanwhile, the cashier had not so much as raised his head. But in the present instance, things had not gone so smoothly. The package of notes, not being found when five o'clock sounded for the ponderous clock in the drawing office, the amount was passed to the account of profit and loss. And soon, as the robbery was discovered, pick detectives hastened off to Liverpool, Glogslog, Harvey, Suez, Brinsley, New York, and other ports, inspired by the preferred reward of two thousand pounds and five per cent on the sum that might be recovered. Detectives were also charged with narrowly watching those who arrived at or left London by rail, and a judicial examination was at once entered upon. There were real grounds for supposing, as the Daily Telegraph said, that the thief did not belong to a professional band on the day of the robbery. A well-dressed gentleman of polished manners and with a well-to-do air had been observed going to and fro in the paying room where the crime was committed a description of him was easily procured and sent to the detectives and some hopeful spirits of whom ralph was one did not despair of his apprehension the papers and clubs were full of the affair and everywhere people were discussing the probabilities of a successful pursuit and the reform club was especially agitated several of its members being bank officials ralph would not concede that the work of the detectives was likely to be in vain for he thought that the prize offered would greatly stimulate their zeal and activity. But Stuart was far from sharing this confidence, and as they placed themselves at the whist-table, they continued to argue the matter. Stuart and Flanagan played together while Phillies Fogg and Fallentin for his partner. As the game proceeded, the conversation ceased excepting between the rubbers, when it revived again. I maintain, said Stuart, that the chances are in favor of the thief, who must be a shrewd fellow. Well, by where can he fly to? asked Ralph. No country is safe for him. Phew! Where could he go, then? Oh, I don't know that. The world is big enough. It was once, said Phileas Fogg, in a low tone. Cut, sir, he added handing the cards to Thomas Flanagan. The discussion fell during the rubber, after which Stuart took up its thread. What do you mean by once? Has the world grown smaller? Certainly, returned Ralph. I agree with Mr. Fogg. The world has grown smaller since a man can now go round it in ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago. And that is why the search for this thief will be more likely to succeed. Also, why the thief can get away more easily. Be so good as to play, Mr. Stewart, said Phileas Fogg. But the incredulous Stewart was not convinced, and when the hand was finished, said eagerly, You have a strange way, Ralph, of proving that the world has grown smaller. So because you can go round it in three months, in eighty days, interrupted Phileas Fogg. That is true, gentlemen, added John Sullivan. Only eighty days. Now that the section between Roth and Alabad on the Great Indian Peninsula Railway has been opened, 
Here is the estimate made by the Daily Telegraph from London to Suez via Mont Sanis and Brindisi by rail and steamboat, seven days. From Suez to Bombay by steamer, thirteen days. From Bombay to Calcutta by rail, three days. From Calcutta to Hong Kong by steamer, thirteen days. From Hong Kong to Yokohama, Japan by steamer, six days. From Yokohama to San Francisco by steamer, twenty-two days. From San Francisco to New York by rail, seven days. From New York to London by steamer and rail, nine days. Total, eighty days. Yes, in eighty days! Exclaimed Stuart, who, in his excitement, made a false deal. But that doesn't take into account bad weather, country winds, shipwrecks, railway accidents, and so on. All included, returned Phyllis Fogg, continuing to play despite the discussion. But suppose the Hindus or Indians pull up the rails, replied Stuart. Suppose they stop the trains, pillage the luggage vans, and scare up the passengers. All included, calmly retorted Mr. Fogg, adding, as he threw down the cards, to trumps. Stuart, whose turn it was to deal, gathered them up, and went on. You are right, theoretically, Mr. Fogg, but practically, practically also, Mr. Stuart, I'd like to see you do it in eighty days. It depends on you. Shall we go? Heaven preserve me, but I would wager four thousand pounds that such a journey made under these conditions is impossible. Quite possible under the contrary, returned Mr. Fogg. Well, make it then. The journey? Round the world in eighty days? Yes! I should like nothing better. When? At once. Only I warn you that I shall do it at your expense. It's absurd! cried Strutt, who was beginning to be annoyed at the persistency of his friend. Come, let's get on with the game. Deal over again, then, said Phyllis Fogg. There's a false deal. Strutt took up the pack with a feverish hand, then suddenly put them down again. Well, Mr. Fogg, said he, it shall be so. I will wager the four thousand on it. Calm yourself, my dear Stuart, said Fonten. It's only a joke. When I say I'll wager, returned Stuart, I mean it. All right, said Mr. Fogg, and turning to the others, he continued, I have a deposit of twenty thousand at Bearings, which I will willingly risk upon it. Twenty thousand pounds, cried Sullivan. Twenty thousand pounds, which you would lose by a single accidental eh? The unforeseen does not exist, quietly replied Phyllis Fogg. But, Mr. Fogg, eighty days are only the estimate of the least possible time in which the journey can be made. A well-used minimum suffices for everything. But in order not to exceed it, you must jump mathematically from train upon steamer, from steamer upon train, again. I will jump mathematically. You are joking! A true Englishman doesn't joke when he's talking about so serious a thing as a wager, replied Mr. Fogg, solemnly. I will bet twenty thousand pounds against anyone who wishes that I will make the tour of the world in eighty days or less, in nineteen hundred and twenty hours, or a hundred and fifty thousand two hundred minutes. Do you accept? We accept, replied Messrs. Stuart, Follentin, Sullivan, Flangin, and Ralph, after consulting each other. Good, said Mr. Fogg. The train leaves for Dover at a quarter before nine. I will take it. This very evening? asked Stuart. This very evening, returned Phyllis Fogg. He took out and consulted a pocket almanac, and added, As today is Wednesday, the 2nd of October, I shall be due in London, in this very room of the Reform Club, on Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before nine p.m., or else the twenty thousand pounds now deposited in my name at Bearings will belong to you, in fact and in right, gentlemen. Here is a check for the amount. A moment of the wager was at once drawn up and signed by the six parties during which Phyllis Fogg preserved a stoical composure. He certainly did not bet to win and had only staked twenty thousand pounds half of his fortune because he foresaw that he might have to expend the other half to carry out this difficult not to say unattainable project 
As for his antagonist, they seemed much agitated, not so much by the value of their stake as because they had some scruples about betting under conditions so difficult to their friend. The clock struck seven, and the party offered to suspend the game so Mr. Fogg might make his preparations for departure. I am quite ready now, was his tranquil response. Diamonds are trumps. Be so good as to play, gentlemen. End of chapter three. This has been a TBL three recording.